Hey friends, Dean here. Before we get you on to your episode, I want to take a moment to invite you to our next virtual online trivia night. Wednesday, May 13th at 8 p.m. Join us either on our Facebook group or on our YouTube page for three rounds of fun trivia, music questions, movie questions, general knowledge questions. It'll be a fun time and a chance to win some prizes and have just a good relaxing night uh, of some trivia at, at home. You don't even have to go out for it. So don't forget, Wednesday, March 13th at 8 p.m., Join us on our Facebook group or YouTube for three rounds of fun virtual online trivia. We'll see you there. Lay back, close your eyes, and come with us on a trip through the prism as we discuss the epic album from Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon. Stay with us. Get ready for the 3324 Podcast, where lifelong friends Dean Legiro and Eric Coover share their love of all things music and movies. Dean has directed short films and is a music trivia buff. And Eric, trained in audio engineering, brings his extensive knowledge of music and film to the conversation as they discuss, debate, and celebrate their favorite albums, films, and much more. Welcome one and all friends, people that are not friends yet, people that will be friends. Welcome everybody to the 3324 Podcast. You have found the best in music and movie podcasting. Dean Legiro here behind the microphone. Eric Cooper also behind the microphone, but not this, we're not the same microphones. Like we're singing like vocals together and we're <laughs> in the same microphone. He's in a different one. I'm at a different one, different location. Not like the beach boys. All right. Hello everyone. <clears throat> good evening. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. Yourself <laughs> doing very well. It's cold. So, uh, so we're on social media. You can find us at 3324 podcast. Uh, that'll work on Instagram and Facebook. We do uh, two live shows per month. Uh, or depending on the month, maybe it would be three, mm -hmm. but uh, we do that. So you can check us out there. That's a, a really fun way to interact and engage with us. We have a blast there. We've got a Facebook group that is booming and blossoming Yeah. Uh, in advance of spring. It, 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 this is like spring springing early for us. So come and join us there as well. There's a lot of great information and a like-minded community. Let's jump in. We're, we're talking about dark side of the mood for mood, dark side of the mood <laughs> Dark Side of the Moon from Pink Floyd. So it's this is a really uh, something I'm surprised we hadn't gotten to early. We were uh, Eric and I. We kind of do our we kind of did our year end recap and kind of looked at what we did, um, things we want to talk about, things we 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 need to get to. And this was kind of ho relatively high on the list of something that we yeah. needed to talk about. Yeah, it was definitely uh, one of the premier, or I suppose the premier progressive rock albums of all time I, I would i would have to say i mean it may not be everyone's favorite in that sense i mean i know there's there's everybody has their favorites everybody has their you know their their go-to album and but this album yeah. in, in itself is just uh I, I don't know how do we how do we talk about it? how do we explain it i don't but, know uh, it's gonna be interesting it, I, yeah. I think i think in the open i said epic and i think that's what this album might yeah. be is not necessarily epic in its scale or its scope. Um, I think it's just epic in, in for a lot of different reasons, which we'll, which we'll go into sure. because it's very, yeah. it's a very interesting album. So let's do the stats. And I think the stats will um, uncover some of this conversation for us. Mm -hmm. We'll start. We're going to be like Sam Neill in Jurassic <laughs> Park. Yeah. Digging for that Raptor claw and very with the, with very lightly with the brush, brushing away the material till we get to the heart of the matter. Yep. And then we're going <laughs> to threaten to open up that kid's stomach with the Raptor claw. <laughs> <laughs> or or blow his mind, one of the two. <laughs> you know, here, here. Have exactly. A little, we'll have a little toke of this and then listen. <laughs> that's it. That, and that's what happened with this album. That was a big probably reason for this album. But let's see. Mm -hmm. The stats are, this was released in March, uh, March 1st, 1973. So it's coming uh, 49 years. <clears throat> coming yeah. on its 49th birthday. Uh, 14 times platinum. That it, that And that's an, a, 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 a kind of a stat that's a moving target. Because it's 14 million copies sold or in excess, but uh, the numbers are probably far more than that because this album sold a ton before they even started tracking that mm -hmm. uh, the the platinum status. So they're, they're, the numbers could be wildly uh, wildly out of range. Two singles from the album, actually, believe it or not, two singles were released from this album: "Money," yeah, which went to number 13 on the Billboard charts, and then "Us and Them," which didn't really do anything. Which I'm actually surprised that time was not the a side of that i'm i'm really i had no idea that us and them was the actual that's such a long song well us <laughs> and them was a separate really was a separate single so they was yeah. money was one and then us and yeah. them and and 
uh, us and them didn't do that. And those are probably the two most accessible. If you're talking about radio songs. Sure. Yeah. That's about it, honestly. And I don't mean that in a bad way. It's just, that's, you know, the way this album is. Um, it hit number one for one week, one week only on the billboard charts, but you got to take a moment and take this, this statistic in. Okay. I'm going to lay this out and you really have to kind of take this statistic in everybody that's listening. It hit number one for one week on the Billboard charts, but it stayed in the top 200 Billboard album chart for 736 consecutive weeks. Mm. It was on the charts for 14 years straight, never leaving the album chart. It's amazing. Okay. Take that in for a second. This album was on the charts for 14 years, years. never leaving. Yep. Okay. Okay. That was 14.1 years. So it exited in in July of 1988. It left. It came back briefly for another couple of weeks. Um, and then Billboard started another chart. They started a new chart called uh, Catalog Album Chart, meaning uh, out, like kind of older albums that were tracking the sales of yeah, that. Yeah. It re-entered that chart. <clears throat> and it's been, uh, I think, over f- all, all together um, over 1,500 weeks. <laughs> on the charts that's, that's astounding Absolutely which is yeah amazing. this is just yeah. you know so this is done and no other album i think the the closest one is a bob marley album but it's not even close to this yeah um when you think about an album staying on the charts for 14 years and it was number one for one week and had no discernible chart hits yeah eric what do you make of that <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to make of it, <laughs> honestly, because I, I I just think that it's such a it was such a breakthrough in in terms of its uh, the just the what it was. It was just a, a, a just a grand experiment, a sonic experiment. I, I you know it was unlike anything. You know, it, it, we, there was a psychedelic period, you know, going to, you know, but the earlier stuff with Floyd was a lot long winded. It was more, you know, sort of. It was definitely more uh, psychedelic and trippy. Yeah. Yeah. And that, you know, this thing was like they were experimenting with looping and 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 vocal effects and sound effects and to such a degree that I think it, it really took it to a whole new level. Other people have done it, of course, including the Beatles and with Floyd, it was more everything was so layered in, in the recording process that it was just, I don't think anybody has ever surpassed it. And and people have tried to do, you know, this kind of thing, you know, all the time, but it's just, it's never been, in my opinion, like one of the, it's one of the best cohesive pieces of sonic material. It's not even, you don't don't even know where music begins and sound effects end. It's kind of like, it's it's so blended. And and, and when we talk about progressive rock, Right, yeah. which Eric is the resident expert. I'm like the uh, I'm like the Anakin Skywalker to his Qui Gon Jinn. <laughs> um, but but one of the words that gets thrown around with with progressive rock when it's not done well is it's it's pompous and it's you know yes overblown <clears throat> and and kind of you know oh it's like you know too much. Why isn't this that though? Why isn't this pompous and overblown and very well could be it's. It, well, it's, it's a very interesting album. It is, and and I think what it is is that they they found their niche. They found that everything was kind of just it just it all came together, and it, it, admittingly so even to them because they, I think it you know the feuding between Waters and Gilmore was already starting at this point. You know, they, you know Waters was such a devotee of of uh, Sid Barrett that that would never leave him. That would always haunt him all the way up to the wall. You know, writing about you know, this, this guy going insane and, and, you know, and that became like a reoccurring theme for Roger Waters. And so mm-hmm. at this point, I, so I just, let's, stop, let's stop there for a second. Let's, okay. let's talk about that a little bit just to get people yeah. caught up. So Pink Floyd was formed in 1964 originally. Okay. Uh, the, the lineup for, for Dark Side of the Moon, uh, David Gilmore on guitar, Roger Waters on bass. They did a lot of other things. These are like the, <laughs> <laughs> like yeah, they, they played, you know, synthesizers, the skeletal you know, version right. of what they did. This is, yeah, uh, this Richard is what they're Wright, known Rich, for, yeah, <laughs> primarily. <laughs> Richard Wright on keyboards <laughs> and Nick Mason on drums. Yeah. And when you mentioned Sid, Sid Barrett, he was the, the founder of Pink Floyd. And, and that original incarnation of Pink Floyd was very psychic, very much in the psychedelia era, the, mm-hmm. the, you know, the mid to late 60s. 
there's conflicting stories about Sid Barrett, but most of them surround are basically around too much LSD, too much acid, yeah. possible mental issues. And he just kind of cracked and, and literally kind of lost, yeah. lost his way. And it became untenable for Pink Floyd to continue with him. So they, so they kind of let him go. But, yeah, but so when you talk about the spirit of Sid, that's what it is, is, is Sid Barrett left Pink Floyd and, and he was the leader of the band. And they actually got dropped mm-hmm. by their label, their original label, when when Sid Barrett left. Because like, well, this guy's the leader. Who are you guys? So you know, we're gonna actually follow him. Um, yeah. So he was pretty a, a pretty significant. He cast a long shadow in Pink Floyd. Yeah. Yeah. Like as I mentioned, uh, especially with Roger Waters. I mean, he was such a, you know, when you think of the Wall, like all the way to '79, and you, you know that whole album to me is still he's still talking about Sid Barrett. I mean, the character of Pink is Sid Barrett. There's yeah. no, there's no, and his presence is felt on this record. This, this, this album, album as well. Yeah. Is, it deals with madness and insanity and, and death and, and all, you know, every life in general, just, you know, just yeah, uh, a lot of different know. themes running through right. this album. Exactly. But I think a lot what, of themes getting back to the point of, of what, what is it about this record that doesn't seem as overblown and as pompous as some, you know, some other acts out or there. Pre- pretentious was the word I was looking yeah. for too, right? Like pretentious yeah. you hear a lot. In, well, I think a lot of it has to do with these virtuosic musicians too, who, you know, and you know, you have all this talent and everybody's trying to kind of trying to play over one another mm-hmm. and groups like, you know, you, f- you find that a lot in groups like yes and King Crimson and like ELP and, these these acts because they're so strong in what they did and so good that everybody wanted their 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 moment to shine right with floyd i think it was more it was agreed that it would had to be a little bit more cohesive and more mm-hmm. just you know more of a group effort you know because everybody kind of played their role and yeah. especially well, while on still this being record, experimental you know, that that exactly. needs to be noted yeah. is cohesive but these songs were work. Most of these songs were worked up live beforehand and kind yeah. of ex- experimented and, and right. taking out a lot of the long jams that if, if left in might've been called yeah. pretentious and overblown. Right. That's so, right. so you said yep. kind of refining it, which is what they did is, is took them out live and fooled around with these ideas and then kind of said, okay, let's go less noodling, the studio and more ex- studio experimentation. And yeah. everybody was of the same mind set. Everybody had the, the same, goal in mind is to make something you know just put something down and and everybody was digging that everybody was Mm -hmm. digging experimenting with sounds and 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 all all textures and all that kind of thing so you know and then you have this this wonderful engineer ah you stole my thunder making sorry i'm sorry go ahead no no, go ahead i'll I'll introduce it i'll introduce it (laughs) making his second appearance yes on the 34 33 24 podcast as an engineer first scene in the Beatles documentary, Get Back, we welcome yeah. Alan Parsons. Yeah. So he, to the he went on, he went on to uh, <laughs> b- bigger things. I mean, he, you know, working with Floyd and then of course he went off and did his own progressive rock stuff on, on his own, like called what the was Alan the name Parsons of, what was Project. What's the name of that band? It's very hard to remember. The Alan Parsons Project. Oh, yeah, he named so it after the... himself. <laughs> go, you go, Alan. <laughs> and you can actually tell, and if you listen to a lot of their stuff, you could actually hear what he had been doing with with both the Beatles and with with Floyd and a lot of that you know just kind of carried over to what he was doing and, and yeah. of course he knew exactly you know but uh, yeah he's a stu- he's a stu- he's one of those studio magicians yeah um he he said all in in later years i think waters downplayed alan parson's influence like yeah he really mm-hmm. you know he's just a guy but i think uh, uh i don't think nick, so nick Ma- I, I think nick mason said no that's not true you know, and Alan Parsons had a, a no, little he bit of sour grapes. Role. Like, you know what? It, it, these guys made out like bandits and it, you know, it should have been a little more equitable for everybody involved. So he had a little. Oh, I agree. Well, Roger yeah. Waters, I have to, I have to, I'm going to say it now, I'll probably say it once. I won't say it again in the episode. Well, let, but he's, but, let me ask you before you say it. Now, that'll lead into your answer. Are you okay. team, are you team Gilmore? I knew you were going to ask Or this, team yeah. Waters? I'm going to go with Gilmore, even okay. though, um, <laughs> because <clears throat> Gilmore, I mean, he had. I think he's the better musician overall. Mm-hmm. I think Waters had the songwriting kit. He had the lyrics. He had the, you know, the concepts, the, you know, but his stuff just became so much, so much, so depressing. And so, and he, and he was a bastard. I mean, he, you know, he, he he's, I think actually Phil Collins <laughs> of all people called him a miserable 
F, you know, like he's such a miserable bastard, especially now in his old age. He's really like, he's just, the guy doesn't like anything. Like he's very critical. He's very, you know, that, that came over time. <laughs> like after, like you could see that, that happening. And, and yeah, a lot more of cynical, the, everything got more cynical. And every, uh, I mean, there was always more, that, there was always that edge to it, but it yeah. kind of really, uh, by the time you get to the wall and the final cut, mm, you know, and he was arrogant. He, you know, everything was, no, it's all mine. It's like, he took the credit for a lot of the stuff and, and Gilmore, you know, there was that, and then it just developed this big feud between the two and they just couldn't stand working with one another. Yeah. And it, it's a shame really. Cause you know, when you consider what was done, yeah. uh, their best stuff arguably came from, I think, me, you know, uh, metal to probably animals at this point before the wall, like the seventies mm -hmm. for me, that was yeah, the, the album metal Floyd. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The album metal. Right. So you have metal, you got, uh, dark side you have uh, wish you were here and you have animals these those those albums are to me like the peak of, mm -hmm. of floyd you know when i think of pink floyd i think the 70s more so than the psychedelic era even though they were you know doing some pr some pretty cool stuff uh, there. up to and including the wall yeah well the wall i mean it was different it was it was it was uh i i personally think the album's overrated to be honest i you know people like favorite Whoa. shots fired uh, shots fired but i i you know it doesn't <laughs> I don't think it compares to this album. Or, it's or, totally or, different. It's a different, yeah, it's a different, it's a different vibe, a different feel. Yeah. It's more of a, a it's definitely like a, a, a stage play type of yeah. thing, right? It's more, like of, a more of a concept. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, Absolutely. It's, the music is uh, of its time too, because you got this more sort of like funky kind of stuff happening on that album. And, you know, they're starting to you know sort of change with the times of the you mm -hmm. know, late seventies. And then, it, it it to me it just it wasn't as like they weren't as together as they mm -hmm. are in, in this in this work you know even yeah. wish you were here I love as well it's like that's the follow up to dark side I I, yep. I I actually actually liked that album better at one point but I but I I, I you know I, I go back and forth <laughs> yeah <laughs> so if, yeah. so if you were gonna if you were gonna tell tell somebody you know just one Pink Floyd album it would be this one it, or would I it be the so. wall this just is, because of the pop of the popularity no, of the wall and accessibility I, I think, of the wall i think because dark side of the moon if you know it, forget pink floyd you want to listen to you want to have an experience and go with dark side of the moon yeah absolutely and it, 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 it transcends far above and beyond the band i mean it's you know it is it's something that i, I don't think they even thought that that, that you know they were going to do as good you know they i i think their expectation was probably not as not as great as what the, you know, the, the finished product turned out to be. And that's yeah. like, you know, call it lightning in a bottle, call it what you will, but it's one of those special. I, I think uh, you can call it lightning in a bottle because yeah. their next, their next few albums didn't do anything, did not even come close right. to the impact that this album had. And, mm -hmm. and obviously it was still, it was still on the charts while those other albums were coming and going. So, um, so let's get into this album. So one of the first things you realize or see about this album is, is it is probably one of the most iconic album covers ever it's a simple yeah. design which they wanted they didn't want anything overblown so they 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 got with uh storm thorgerson who wow yeah um look him up on wikipedia and and look at this stuff that he's done he, um, yeah, he's formed, worked with everybody he even worked with he did the first three elo albums he's yeah, worked his, with, with old uh, old artists new artists he is just a and, and all different types of of looks i mean he did he worked on paul mccartney pipes a piece so many different artists and so many different types of albums. So they said to him, you know, we want just something simple. Yeah. Thorgerson, and, I'm going to spell his last name, T-H-O-R-G-E-R-S-O-N. Or you could look up under his, the company name that he founded, which was Hypnosis. Hypnosis. Yep. And they, yeah, like, like Dean was saying, wow. they're, I mean, they're incredible, you know, that's my favorite iconic album artwork of all this company that did like they did Genesis, they did Peter yeah, they Gabriel. Did six. They, they've done yeah. everything. Under Absolutely the sun. amazing stuff. Yeah. So, so they, they <clears throat> said, you know, we want something simple and really you don't get much something as simple as, yeah. as a prism with one beam of light going through and a rainbow coming out the other side. And mm -hmm. it just became an, a simple iconic image. And if you're a beginning artist and you're into music, it's probably something that you've, replicated yourself in art class because you, you can kind of do it very simply and get yeah. it done. So uh, it, it started with that. And, and again, they, they were experimenting with, with, with songs on the road and kind of working them out and then figuring out what can be discarded and thrown away to make it, to whittle it down to something uh, usable. 
they also interviewed uh, friends and road crew and yeah. recorded the interviews, asked them like kind of random questions like, what is death? Or are you afraid to die? Or this, that, mm-hmm. and the other thing. And they just got all these random answers. And that's when you, when you hear the talking throughout this album, it's those responses. Yeah. You don't necessarily know what the questions are, <clears> but those are the, they're the responses to the questions. So it, they're, they're put together in such a way that it sounds almost like some type of a narrative, but they just simply ask their road crew like these random questions. Yeah, I, I brought uh, the, their uh, road manager, um, who is the father of Naomi Watts, the, uh, the actress. And he, he's, the, he's the guy that said in the beginning where he says, I've been mad for fucking years. And, you know, like that's, that's him, you know, <laughs> or it might have been actually, no, I, you know what? Scratch that. I think he's the one that's doing the, the, the maniacal laughing. The laughing? The laughing, I think the, the other the, the other thing is is I think a roadie or something like yeah. That, there's a couple of different tech, guys yeah. that they use, so it's kind of yeah. an interesting these all these different things kind of coming together. And um, you know, the album the album proper has has ten tracks on it. Mm-hmm. For all intents and purposes, it actually only has two tracks. The album starts, you know, one side one is all intertwined. The the, the songs meld into each other and flow, yeah. and then. The only reason they probably don't all flow is because you had to turn the album over back then. So then it <laughs> starts right. side two. And then that whole thing, like you, you had said earlier, like a suite, which is, yeah. which is interesting because they don't, they're not positioning it that way of, Oh, here's, here's this. And we're connecting them. Each, each song has a different title. They they're not calling it that. It's, yeah. And it, you wouldn't it's, know it, it if you just looked yeah. at the tracks, you'd be like, That's Oh, okay. Right. There's, here's the songs, but they all flow into each other uh, seamlessly on each and side. That, so you don't, and that, all came, and, and that all came together with the editing and, and, and it just putting, you know, things together. They, like you mentioned before, they were working up stuff live, little snippets of little pieces that they would <clears throat> sort of take and, and, you know, put together and, and some things were longer and they cut it. And it just, the album just kind of came out the way it did. And it wasn't really intended, I think in the, in the, in the necessarily in the order that it, that it turned out to be. Yeah. So they're, they're, you know, if they're calling it a suite, it, it just, it just flows. It just, it is. And that's what makes it such a great listen is this is, this is really, we, you know, we say it a lot on other episodes, but this one really, I mean, there's, I don't think there's any exception. You can't really drop the needle or you don't really want to drop the needle in the middle of, of this record at all. There's there's no reason to, because you're not, yeah. Like, Oh, I'm going to listen to, to on the run. Okay, great. But like, why, like why you need to, it's not even, it's not a song per se. Exactly. It's, it's just a piece. <laughs> it's just a piece of. But it is a song. It's like a song. It's but a track. It's not it's, because it they, a, it's it's a track. Yeah. It has a title, but it is just it's, a piece of. It is a piece of of the whole larger puzzle, right? That, that's, <laughs> that's what right. it is. Is is you're not going to be able to uh, out of, aside from money the two the two that were singles, and I said that I said those are pretty much the only two songs that you could potentially listen to on on their own. Yeah. And kind of get something from, but you really still don't want to. It's like there's there's no, no. reason to. When I listen to this album, like I don't know, three or four times in the run up, yeah. And each time I listen, I'm like, yeah, like this needs to be just. You got to sit. This is what we talked about when we said music was becoming made to be listened to, and that's what this yeah. is. And maybe that's and people obviously during in '73, I'm sure there was a lot of people with the black lights and the and the blue or the blue lights and the posters and. Mm-hmm. whatever trip they were you whatever they were using to enhance the trip but you don't need to do that to enjoy this as well you can just put your headphones on and oh I, yeah and, and go was, in on it what was your first experience with the album when was the first time you heard it <sighs> I, I i couldn't tell you i do remember funny thing is when we <laughs> used to work for suncoast which yeah. is a now defunct uh video store um, when we used to have new, new people, new teammates starting, and we would have to show them the loss prevention video, they used the beginning of money in the video, <laughs> like, like showing how people steal, like we'd have to show a video about how people That's steal right. That's like, right. CDs and, mu- and movies and stuff. And, and the, and the, the video start would start with that, with the cash register thing of money. So like, that was kind of like the most commercial so perfectly it, timed, but, so um, perfectly. Yeah, that was, that was so great. Because <laughs> it was know? about stealing, but it was... If you're uh, not familiar with the track Money, it starts off with this with, with these sound effects of a cash register. And I think and were, and Roger Waters change. was throwing change into a bowl. And yeah. it's all done, like, it's really timed and it's really... Mm-hmm. And it becomes a rhythm, which I which was... I'm all about rhythm. So it just, it, it, just it, it kind of takes on this seven-part rhythm that it just keeps looping over yep. and over. And then the, the, the bass kicks in. 
Yep. So and great. then and then you uh, gave me um when the final cut came out, their last album. Yeah. You got it on cassette. Yeah. And I don't think you cared for it too much. You're like, ah, oh, it's no. just a piece of junk or whatever. Bah, bah, bah. I, it was, I, it was so you, a, you I, threw it yeah. my way. And there was that one song that I really liked, which was Not Now John. Not I think Now John, both like that. which was Gilmore. Which, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> the best so, song on so the that album. was kind of, you know, and, and, then, then, and then outside of like The Wall, obviously mm-hmm. another brick in the wall when that song came out in 79 or whatever it was. I mean, it was just everywhere. I mean, Pink Floyd just kind of, but, it, but yeah. it was weird because it was not really a follow up that was a hit. But another brick in the wall was just such a monster, monster hit. It was, and it was so taken out of context too. I remember when it when it first came out. My mom, you know, I remember what what is this? Jerry, to, to talking about school and you know how dare you know like what you know that's not what they're you know it's not really <laughs> what the song's about, Ma. You got to experience the whole album. Yeah, I had to kind of explain the whole thing to her. <laughs> Explaining and just, the wall to your mother. I, I don't know what you're talking about. And like, <laughs> but yeah, my my first experience with with Dark Side. Uh, God, it was, um, I know I had the first time I heard the album, somebody played it for me. I think it was a cousin or something, but it was ah, 77, 78 around that time. And, but the first time I actually had the profound experience, I, I had it on vinyl and that was the time, you know, like you said, you put the headphones on, I actually turned the lights off. You yeah. know, I've mentioned this before in a few episodes, that's the best way to listen, you know, but it, it terrified me. <laughs> I ended up. It scared the living crap out. I, 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 you know, because a lot of the stuff you just didn't expect because I didn't hear it the first time. Yeah. Right. You just heard like bits and pieces and I wasn't really, really paying attention more or less. But when I put it on and I've ex- experienced like that and you hear all the nuances and the voices and it just scares the living hell out of you. Like when the screaming and the, and the, you know, and then yeah, the, it's just, it's the, just, just an, the, aura, it's an aura, audit, auditory trip. It yeah, really just, is. It, just when you know people talking about death and and this, it's such a at such a young age. It's like, why am I listening to this? But it was such a tri- <laughs> it was it was a trip. Yeah. And no, I didn't. I never. And that's the thing. It's like the, a lot of their music obviously is associated with with the drug culture and and that kind of thing. You can't listen to this stuff without yeah. that. And I don't. I I totally disagree with that. I think you. Yeah, no. You could still have a profound experience with this. Stuff Absolutely, you know, and, and yeah. appreciate what they did too. Exactly. I mean, that's the whole yeah. thing is is when you listen to it now. Um, I'm listening to it. and I'm like, I'm just amazed at, at by it as a piece of music. Yeah, as as one side of just because you you again, like we said, with progressive rock, it can get pretentious and overblown and long winded keyboard, keyboard solos that never yeah. end. That's right. Yeah, you know, and organs that never end, and all that kind of stuff. So, so to be able to rein it in, but yeah. still deliver those things, and that's the thing is, it, this is not like, oh, this is not wimpy progressive rock. Mm-hmm. Um, there, there's some, in, like I said, some intense themes, fear of flying, just life and getting older. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, there, you know, brain damage refers to Sid Barrett and his struggles. So there's a lot of like creepy stuff, but ultimately very listenable and i think the reason why is is most of the tracks were written by roger waters but the good thing and i'm going to people might give me grief for it the good thing about it is he doesn't sing on most of the album even though he's the primary mm-hmm. lyricist david gilmore gets the 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 lion's share of the vocals and i think that is so important yeah he had because his voice, voice is calming <laughs> okay. I'm going like to say it. He is. He's got the. He's got the better voice. His voice is very calming on this yes. album, even when he's singing in in a little bit of a of a more forceful yeah. me- mode. That's right. It's still like this. It, it kind of washes over you, like time, yeah. like songs like time and us and them. Yeah. It, it just kind of it it kind of comes over you like a blanket, and he just kind of brings you along. And then you know the saxophone comes in on the us and that. It's just like this. Just so many different things going I think, on. I think Waters knew that going in i think you know when when they were recording this thing and, and i think the mood of it and what they were doing i think he he understood and he and uh him and rick, rick wright uh gilmore and rick wright both had similar vocals like their their voices were you know so when they harmonized you could swear it's gilmore being multi-tracked but it's you know it's like especially on time that's that's richard wright singing with gilmore yeah i i totally agree that's why i you know like that's why i said he's the better musician uh, vocally, you know, his guitar playing is astounding. He, I, you know, he could hit notes that, that just take you, God, that just, you know, blast off into the stratosphere. I mean, he, you yeah. know, the way he very underrated nowadays, very, sing, singled up, but it, but, but played 
in a way that is not like he's not a rock star type of guitar player. He's yeah, not, he's not like, flash. you know, flashy. It's for effect. It's for, yeah. you know, this kind of thing and, 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 and bringing it in into experimentation. And, yeah. and even I, though in the live setting, it's like, it's you're wow. You know, <laughs> you, yeah, I, I put, I put Gilmore so. in like the, the Clapton and Mark Knopfler, Absolutely. kind of arena yeah. they're more like of the craftsmen in, yeah yeah it you know play you know f- playing for feel mm-hmm. and not for notes per minute type of thing you know and there's Nuance. nothing wrong with yeah. there's nothing wrong with notes per minute and and it's got a it's got a place but you know like clapton gilmore and and mark Knopfler, i, I put them into that finesse they're finesse right. players yeah right and that's and that's what you you know with with this if those solos were like r- ripping and blazing along no, it, it, it would have it would have been like no like ah uh, that that's when it would have gotten into the pretentiousness this was just the right that's not what floyd's all about yeah really, just the right you know? flow that right. this album has and and that's the thing yeah. is it just kind of it's almost like like getting into a, a, a small rowboat and someone just kind of pushes you gently into the water <laughs> and you just start going like it's you're ironic not, you you're say not that. rowing but you're just kind of you just it, like no, the current I, just kind of takes you and that's what this album is I, that's it's, it's ironic that you say that because in a lot of their live shows they, they do have that image of, of oh, like really? water and yeah oh, there's somebody saw. in a boat like being like <laughs> I yeah never saw them. No, i never saw them either i saw them separate i saw waters <laughs> on the pros and cons t- tour which was his first solo album uh-huh. post post yeah, pros and wall. cons of hitchhiking yeah and uh i I missed out because the first leg of the tour Clapton actually played with him, but wow. I got to see the second leg, which was Andy Fairweather the low. That, even over better. For... I'll go with it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> AF, AFL is the man. There you if go. You don't know yeah. him. But, uh, but, then, I, but then I saw uh, Gilmore on the, about his about face tour mm-hmm. uh, at the pier, which was, amazing. yeah, but that was more of sort of a, a straightforward rock but he did a lot of Floyd and, and of course waters put on the show because I saw yeah. him at radio city. So he had the stage. It was like seeing pink Floyd. It had like the wall. It first half of the show was like pink Floyd stuff. And then the second half yeah. was, and he pretty the much takes the, album. And he pretty yeah. much takes waters pretty much takes the wall out now that like, that's his thing or that was his big he, thing. He was never gives up on wall. that album because that's his bread and butter. I mean, it's yeah. his, his, you know, Gilmore, yeah, I mean, gonna, he, you know. yeah, he took Floyd into a new, into a new direction. He refused to give up the name, and and I think m- musically speaking, what he did in the later years was more true to what they did in mm-hmm. around this time period. It's more, yeah. it's not probably lyrically not as good, maybe you know, but more atmospheric and more like much that more feel a- exactly, yeah, and not That's as right. like b- biting that you know, like yeah. Waters has that bite that bite to him to, mm-hmm. to the lyrics and also to his his delivery sometimes, you know, and that's. Um, with Dark Side of the Moon, even even he's reined in uh, yeah. on his songs, you know, Brain Damage. He strikes the right kind of sense of paranoia on Brain Damage. And that's one of the, yeah. the Brain Damage. You may not know it by the title, but you'll know the song. It starts off with the lunatics are on the grass. Yeah, uh, it is one of the quintessential <laughs> Floyd. I never got to see Floyd. The, the closest I came. And this was a big thing back in the day was Laser Floyd. I don't oh, know if yes. they do. I don't know if they do laser shows for for people of a certain age. Laser shows were the thing. You, they would always be held in planetariums, and if you don't yeah. know what a planetarium is, we're going way back. But but they used to a planetarium is basically like a domed uh, theater where you would go see uh, stuff about the constellations. So it'd be like you were looking up in the stars, and they would show That's you right. different yeah. things. When they weren't doing that enterprising individuals came up with these laser light shows and they would hook it up and you would go and they would do laser Floyd and Led Zeppelin and all these different things. I don't know if they still do them, but I saw laser Floyd like in the early eighties. Yeah. I was not prepared. I I, I didn't know much about Floyd. So I wasn't, was like, Oh, we're going to see laser. I saw it with you. I saw it. That was when we were in the, went to the city. Yeah. 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 It was like, it was like laser Floyd at midnight or something crazy like that. And we're laying back and and it's just like, welcome to the machine and all this crazy stuff. That's what started. Welcome to the machine was the first track. Oh, I remember. And it was loud. It was great. It was, that was, yeah. Yeah, I walked out like crap in my pants. I'm like, I don't know what the (laughs) hell just happened to me, but (laughs) so so laser shows were the big thing. So that was my closest interaction or, or I did see Andy Fairweather low live and Clapton. So, so those are, those are byproducts, but uh, getting back to this album is just it, it starts off with, with you know, and the funny thing is Speak to Me is is kind of like a little intro song. Very, you know, it's, it, it, but it kind of has all the elements of what you're about to hear. There are so many it, it, within that beginning. There are so many callbacks to 
other yeah, songs. It, right. You it hear you hear the the cash register right. from money. You hear um, the laughing. You the, hear the, the heartbeat starts the heartbeat. off, but yep. but it's also at the end of eclipse. Uh, mm-hmm. The clock ticking is is heard in in the song "Time." Mm-hmm. The the Peter Watts you said uh, Naomi Watts's father that laughing is heard in heard in this part, but you don't hear it again until brain damage. Yeah, Claire Tor. We need to talk about Claire Tor. Oh, also absolutely. Great, yeah. great gig in the sky. So we'll get that. You hear her, some of her vocalizations in this. So the the kind of the beginning song speak to me kind of is almost like a prologue at the beginning. Yeah, it's, it's giving you everything that you're gonna hear, but it gives it to you at the beginning. You don't realize what it is. When you listen to it again, you're like, "Oh wait, I, that was in That's that familiar. other song yep. there." Like, like you, you, you don't, you have to listen to it again to realize that you heard it after, yeah. after the fact. So, this is this is a, it, it's really it's an it's a it's a very interesting album. If if you're if you're not into Pink Floyd, you got to listen to it. And if you want something different, you have to listen to this album because it's just one of those ones that yeah. you, you're never going to know when. A, if you don't watch, if you're if you're listening on Spotify and and you're not looking at the songs, you're not going to know when one ends and one begins. So you're going to think, oh, when's the next song? Mm-hmm. You'll never get that till you get to money. That's right. Yeah, because there are no it, gaps. It, the songs are no just gaps. seamless, and and they have echoes of the previous song in the next song, so it flows seamlessly. Where you don't really realize that you're into something else, which is they they really pulled it off brilliantly. It, w- it wasn't a gimmick. Um, no. And when we get to the the last song on the first side, which is great, the uh, great gig in the sky, which is really for the most part an instrumental song. It is right? Rick, done, Rick, Rick done by done by it. Richard Wright. Mm-hmm. And, and it's, they, it's a beautiful melody melody that he plays on the piano, this little noodling thing. And it's just, it's, it's really, it's simple, but, but effective. And it just really, and it starts it's, building. It's melancholy. And then all yeah. of a sudden this vocalist comes in, this, this, uh, this lady named Claire, uh, Claire, Claire Tori. Tori. And man, does she go to town? <laughs> this yeah, song, well, like, the, the funny thing about Claire Tori, she was, she was suggested by Alan Parsons. See, and they don't give him enough credit, right? They were, yeah. they were looking yeah. for some, some, somebody to do vocalization. So Alan Parsons is like, yeah, I saw this woman on TV or she does some other stuff. So let's get her. They bring her in and they're kind of like, well, we're looking for kind of like sensual, yeah. not necessarily sexual sounds, but, but that kind of a thing. So she starts singing like, Ooh, baby. And Oh, ah, and they're like, no, 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 no. No not words. That. <laughs> like, yeah. Not that. Not right. That's not the kind of stuff we're looking for. So then she says, okay, well, let me think of my instrument as a voice, and then you get this the the great oh gig my. in the sky, and you get some vocalizations that, that are, are just you know it is well I mean let's off the charts it's it's off the charts and and let's and let's be honest I mean you know we we say they didn't want this this sort of sexual you know thing but it does kind of build up that that way doesn't it like it's absolutely almost like a, to a crescendo to a crescendo or if you we'll will. leave it and, at that <laughs> yeah. The song in itself is is supposed to be about death and and like you know like you know ascending the to in the heaven. sky. That's, yeah, that's exactly. It, yeah. So you know it really <laughs> takes you to this this whole level of, of you know and the, and the, it's completely wordless. There's no yeah. words. There's just it's just vocal and it's yeah, it's, it's vocalizations amazing. And, it's amazing. and sounds and and it's funny when you, when you know what she said where she said i'm going to use i'm going to think of my voice as an instrument then you yeah. then it totally makes sense with what she's doing and it's like yes this is this is the same thing as playing a guitar or playing a bass or playing a keyboard mm-hmm. um the funny thing is is they paid her like flat 60 bucks for the session or whatever yeah um wasn't until many years later she's like you know what i kind of contributed to that i kind of contributed to the writing because of my vocalizations that is a part of the song so she right. uh, you know took him to court um, they settled, so I'm sure she got paid, and, and then she got credit. You know, she got and, credit post 2005 when, like, yeah, you know, rightly subsequent so. re-releases. Yeah, yeah. Her, her contribution was yep. not to be. Uh, it wasn't like she did a couple of oohs and ahs and then left. I mean, she was really the uh, almost the centerpiece. Once she got cooking, mm-hmm. she was the centerpiece of that song, and she provided the the melody or whatever she was providing with her instrument. Think of it as a. Uh, it, it, it could be like. Um, well, it could be anything, really. A guitar. It could have been a, yeah. a saxophone. It could, but have it was been her a, voice. You know, but it was a trumpet. Whatever. It was uh, uh, the human voice, and that's you know that's that's something yeah. that you know a lot of people take for granted. I think in, in in terms of just thinking of it as an instrument, you know, people like oh the tone. It's all about you know sometimes it's about the words and and the lyrics and that you know. But in this case, <laughs> you know, it's about the feeling and she rips. You, you want to hear yeah. a vocalist really? I mean, I think they said it was three sessions. 
yeah. uh, that they stitched together, and she really gave it all. Her and all. she was embarrassed by it. I think I think she yeah. said that. Yeah, she uh, after she was, did a good job. Well, at, at, at she yeah. she was. I, th- I think I did it. I went a little bit too overboard. <laughs> she was like really, really embarrassed by it. But they loved it. You know, the yeah. rest of the band. I think uh, Gilmore was actually in charge of that session uh, because I think initially they they had asked her to do it, and she. She wanted to go to a Chuck Berry concert. She wanted she to go to no. a Chuck Berry concert. That's right. And she <laughs> like, said I can't, no. I can't, what? So, so they had to reschedule. And then and Gilmore, <laughs> Gilmore, yeah, Gilmore you know, was I'm in not, charge I'm of the session. I'm not going to perform and get paid. I'm going to want to go see Chuck Berry at the Hammersmith Odeon or wherever he was. Can, can we do this on like? Can we do this on Sunday? So they rescheduled yeah, for her. Right. And you know, maybe she thought that it was just maybe she thought she was just going to contribute some backing yeah. vocals to something, and which they which you is know basically there are what she did. But, but, but there are backing vocalists on this on this album yeah. as well, but not you know certainly not to the, you know the level that she you know or the contribution that she made was is yeah. absolutely astounding. Yeah. yeah. On on, on yeah. side one, another popular song is "Time," which is and my the, favorite. The big thing the big thing about this song nowadays, uh, we talk about reaction videos. There's a lot of reaction videos on YouTube of people listening to this, yeah, and crying at the end by the time it's done mm-hmm. because of the lyrical, you know. Uh, the the lyrical content. I've done it at karaoke, st- starting and, and not not hearing <laughs> not hearing the gun go off and and ten years go by your life and you don't realize it. It really right. is about uh, about you've missed, missed the starting gun and, and yeah, it's a, and, and it's a cautionary piece about yeah. um, live your life to the fullest. It, you know, d- yeah. you know, don't waste your life. It you know, it, it before you know it, it's it's here. Yeah. I don't see it as, you know, I, I see it as that. I don't see it as a, like a depressing piece of music. I think it's a gorgeous piece of music, fr- frankly. And yeah, it, you know, I've, I've actually, our friend Andy, you know, him and I used to do it at karaoke a lot. <laughs> he would take the Gilmore part <laughs> How'd you be- and I take Rich, Rick Wright's part. I take the, you know, <laughs> it's not the kind of song you play, you know, you want to yeah. sing at karaoke and people are like, what the, you know, like, but uh, you know, we, we just loved it so much that, it, you know, it's just, you know, yeah. But, so um and then so when you get you you get to side two and of course it opens with money which is which is one of their one of the probably premier Pink Floyd songs. There's not a ton of them, you know. Yeah. That's the thing is Pink Floyd is so well regarded, but there's not a ton of like songs that kind of stand out. There's a, it's just a handful, but but a lot of them are on this album. Money, and then it goes right into us and them, yeah, which is classic classic Floyd, and it happens to be the longest song on there. But it's just got that like by the time you get to us and them. I think you're in the mode and you're mm-hmm. in the, you're right. You're right in the right headspace. And like I said, what, like I said earlier, like when that sax kicks in and it's just so like, you're not yeah. hearing, you're hearing so many different things on this album that you're not, you know, from the alarm clocks and time, like blowing your ears out and, and, and kind of waking you up and, and scaring you to then having something like us and them, where it's just, you're floating away on this really light, gentle saxophone playing and, yeah, and this mellow, the mellow guitar, and it's just such a great. Yeah, at that point, vibe. you're already you're floating. I can you're, understand you're, why people were wasted in listening to. I mean, I totally get it. I, I totally understand. I'm not like but, you know, yeah, but, but like you say, <laughs> you get to that point in the album where you're you literally feel like you're floating. You're you're yeah. just you know, and 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 or you're right. Those little nuances just kind of just wash over you, and it's like going one ear and out the other, and it's just. And then, you know, then of course, the, you know, it's been released, re-released so many times. Like there's a quadraphonic version of it where they've, the mix is different. And, yeah. you know, if you have that kind of equipment, uh, that, that, that's great. But I think just the best way to listen to it is, is the vinyl, the original, you know, vinyl with the headphones. I mean, there's just nothing like that experience. Of, yeah. I'm still, you know, I'm still on the hunt for a, a nice vinyl. Co- like I'm not in a rush. Yeah. I it's wish like I one still of those had ones. my and, copy. Yeah. And and the and the prices are going up on it. So it's like I'm when I find the right used copy, I'm gonna pull the trigger. So I'm kind of like, mm-hmm. I want it, but I'm not rushing to get it because I'm not just gonna buy like a crappy copy to have. Yeah. I'm like, I'm I'm gonna make sure I kind of pull the trigger the right way. Um and then of course brain damage, which we finally hear from from Roger Waters, and it's got some some Sid Barrett references in there. If if the band starts playing different tunes. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll see you on the dark side of the moon. That that's a direct reference to when he started to break down, yeah, and play concerts. And he would start playing something different, or he would start to slowly detune his guitar while he was playing, or or mm-hmm. play one chord over and over. And it, it is like you said that that haunting the the shadow that Sid Barrett cast on on the band, yeah. Because um, then they would they would you know memorialize him again and shine on you crazy diamond as well. So it's Which, just kind of you oh, know he, yeah he was <clears throat> just kind of 
subject matter for this as well for this cautionary tale and just uh and it, it goes it's into amazing what you can and, yeah i mean just sitting down and writing this these pieces just based on that just based on one person's uh decline is uh you know it's a testament to uh geeks like myself who you know i i i don't like to reveal that much about myself but i i was very introverted as a kid i i was very isolated i i i this kind of stuff this was the kind of stuff that i retreated to and listened to because it was just so odd and so weird and it was almost like my my punk rock in a way, in a way when punk rock to me was you know exposed myself to a lot of this kind of stuff and then when punk rock did come out i like i didn't understand it right you're kind of like mm-hmm. what is the big deal about punk rock i almost feel like i i became somewhat of a snob in a way because i've been listening to all this lush mm-hmm. well produced material that i just didn't get the three chord raw thing that what you know these guys are not great musicians you know it's like i, I want to listen to something yeah what's all this crunchy stuff and exactly you know you know and distorted. i just didn't get it i didn't get it you know you know but I, that's all right i mean i don't i don't you know i missed i might have missed out on some things when they when they first came out and that's in that regard but i i don't regret you know the things that i got into myself yeah, and you know the beautiful thing about it the music know. isn't going anywhere it's still there right. to be discovered exactly. so it's not like yeah. you it's passed you by and and you you're never going to be able to witness it or or experience it so yeah as we begin to close out so I'm, i i have a question for you at the end so we'll save yeah. that okay but um the legacy of of this album carries well you know through through the 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 sales and through all the mm-hmm. the compact disc era and again it stayed on the charts for umpteen years and it's still on the charts yeah but then there was this phenomenon in the mid 90s <laughs> yeah i know okay. what you're going. i know where Called you're going dark side of the rainbow and wh- whoever I, I don't i can't trace the actual be- start of it but basically what someone figured out or or the this is the theory mm-hmm. is that if you put on the movie the wizard of oz and i believe it, you know it starts with the mgm with the lion roar i believe if you start dark side of the move on moon on the third roar yeah the music on dark side of the moon will sync with the movie the wizard of oz and that became a thing in it back in the day yeah. of trying to to li- link it up and certain lyrics will be spoken at the time that match with things on on the screen certain sound effects in, in the album will will correspond with certain things happening in in the in the movie so this became like a mild sensation and then everybody started you know and that's when i when i worked we worked at suncoast and people were coming in buying the wizard of oz and asking if we had dark side of the moon as well to pair it up to listen to Mm-hmm. Um, and we did it. I did it a couple of times and we used to sync it up, but all you have to do is go to the original people involved and none of them say that this was what we were doing. Alan Parsons said there was never a copy of wizard of Oz there. As far as I know, yeah. it's just one of those <laughs> happenstances that somebody, somebody had the time to, to, put, to, to do this, to sit down and, and put this together. And it's, it's, it's metaphorical. It's, 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 if you really want to go there, it is like, yeah, you, it's like that sync. It's like a synchronous kind of thing where one thing is happening, but like the music reflects, it It doesn't have to match up in the sense where it's, it's not like, uh, the, the, for example, like the, the, the cyclone in the wizard of Oz that yeah. you don't hear a, a tornado in, on the album. It's not like you hear something yeah. else. You you might hear at that point, some, some voice or somebody screaming, perhaps, or maybe get, get great in the sky at that point in, of the, of the movie or whatever. But mm-hmm it just somehow fit. It's somehow somebody thought that this, well, this fits, this, 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 this works together. This yeah. melds together. I, I don't know. I, I, you know, I, I, yeah, I think it's cool, but I, I never really bought into the whole, yeah. That whole I, well, thing. The easiest you know? way to debunk it is if that was the case. Yeah. Why wasn't the album as long as the movie, why would you stop, you know, 40 minutes or however long yeah. the album, why would you stop 40 minutes in and, and not continue? Why wouldn't you make That's a double right. album and, and do it? So, yeah. Um, but, and again, all the members are like, this is just a hogwash and not really. Yeah, we, and we didn't, didn't write didn't a happen, soundtrack but, you know, to, to, to Wizard of Oz. To Wizard of Oz. Not, <laughs> and, you know, and, and, that, and that might be the thing. It's like, you notice that, that a lot of artists too, they, you know, uh, especially in this vein 
uh, they'll go back and they'll record music for like silent films that yeah. have lost their their soundtracks over the years. Like you mm -hmm. know they're they're unrecoverable or they're so you know so well far gone that they they need a new score, that kind of thing. And you see like th these kinds of artists doing that. So I th I think that's kind of neat when you yeah. you know well the most one of the most famous ones was Giorgio Moroder did it with Metropolis. Yeah, yeah. and you had Freddie Mercury had all, all these artists and they and they kind of did a. a updated you know and that was back in the 80s so that's mm -hmm. <laughs> not so recent geez <laughs> i was like oh yeah recently <laughs> okay 1980 mm -hmm. <laughs> so i know this, uh this... yeah i, I, I think yeah. another example is uh adrian utley of uh of uh portishead did music for like i think it was joan uh the Joan of Arc, like the silent film, the Passion, yeah, the of, Joan Passion of, of Joan of Arc. Yeah, he did. He 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 did a score for for that. I don't know nice. if it was like released as such, but I think I, mm -hmm. he might have been doing it just for an experiment or whatever. But he mm -hmm. that 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 did that just that's cool, you know. Like they would watch a film and you could put your music to it and and give your own interpretation of what that is and the mm -hmm. imagery and so I you know so that I don't know if it came from that. I don't know if that might have been where that came from with the wizard of oz and that in that sense I maybe i think it's some dude that had too much time on his hands and maybe a little <laughs> too, too many, much, much to smoke. <laughs> yeah yeah you know, like, probably like his, like his girlfriend was watching <laughs> wizard of oz and he had like dark side of the moon on in the headphones and it just like synced up and he's like oh yeah, crap, maybe man, maybe know? maybe they did it this, i found it so anyway the question i have as our resident prog expert okay and it, you kind of started to touch on it at the beginning but i don't know if you answered it mm. Is is this the best prog album of all time? I think take into so. consideration, I, it, take into consideration not just the music, but take into consideration its impact. You know, fourteen years consecutively on the charts without yeah. ever leaving the album charts, and then re re entering the charts for another like you know, no, I, I, fifteen I, years. Yeah, I could definitely say confidently say yes, that, absolutely. It is. It, it's more than just like I said. It it. it it's bigger than the band. It's bigger mm -hmm. than, than everyone involved. It is definitely, it, it, it just rises above that. They did something really special here and it, it will go on as the, the experiment that it is. And I don't think it's ever going to really die. Hey, check this out. I mean, people are to this day are still influ influenced by it. You yeah. know, a lot of these newer, newer prog bands today that are, you know, uh, I think even you know, people like Radiohead and, and, you know, they're still referring to, you know, Dark Side as their yeah. uh, grand influence. And, and I think that's going to continue. Yeah, yeah, it's just it's it's, it's quite the experience. Yeah, I, I don't so, think you've yeah. heard it here first, but you heard it here. I don't think he may be. He may, be, he may not be the first one, but he's the, he's the definitive word on our podcast about it. So uh, greatest greatest prog album of all time. Better than think six. So. Better than yes. Better than ELP. Better than Genesis. Mm hmm. Uh, King Crimson, Marillion, all those guys stack think, them up. Well, I think, and, I mean, it, a lot of it has of to, you know, let's, let's, let's give some credit to Alan Parsons. Let's give it to, you mm -hmm. know, the recording way ahead of its time. Yeah. For 73. Right? I mean, and you had, you were hearing oh. sounds on this record that people are still employing today yeah. in, in a more modern setting. And it's, it, to me, it sounds this, this album already did it. Like I hear stuff on, you know, oh, I, I, yeah, that sounds like. Floyd. I mean, they, yeah. they, they did that, you know, the, 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 the yeah, use of the uh, keyboards was not, was not antiquated if, in such if, a way, you if know, you, or dated. if you want a, uh, a, a direct example, you can look up Queensryche and their song silent lucidity. If you <laughs> yeah, want a, yeah. if you want a direct Pink Floyd influence from this album, yeah. um, silent lucidity. And you know what, we'll, we'll link that in the show notes. So you can check out something re a, a very recent, relatively recent, sorry. <laughs> Yeah. relatively recent influence that really you can hear you can hear the pink floyd influence and so mm -hmm. uh that's gonna do it for this episode of the 3324 podcast pink floyd dark side of the moon absolutely take the trip with them it's gonna be worth it sit down give yourself 45 minutes of of your own time and and put your headphones on and and take the audio trip with them we we guarantee you will not be disappointed in this one so mm. Um, you can find us, like I said earlier, on social media. Check us out there. Find us on social media. Say hi to us. We love to interact with you. We love uh, meeting new people online and, and having new people interact and, and post. So go ahead and do that. Feel free. Uh, join us there, won't you? We, we would love to see you. For Eric, this has been Dean. Thanks for joining us. We will see you on the flip side. You've been listening to the 3324 Podcast with Dean Legiro and Eric Cooper. 
you can find us on your favorite podcast provider. So please like, subscribe, and rate to become a part of the 3324 family. Your feedback is important, so make sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at 3324podcast and on Twitter at 3324p to join the conversation. 